Today we want to have a closer look at how Claude Dornier designed his first plane. The task came from Graf Zeppelin himself, who saw in summer 1914, when the First World War started, that planes are the future. And his company should not just rely on airships. So he gave Dornier, the very capable engineer with his own department door, the task to design a plane which can carry a 1000 kg bomb to the London docks. Tournier himself was never a friend of military projects and avoided going to the army, in his case the French army because his father was French, but Tournier was interested in the challenge to design such a huge plane. Also, since he visited the Paris air show eight months earlier, his main interest was on heavier than air vehicles anyway. He stopped designing the new generation Zeppelin to cross the Atlantic and started with the new plane project. So how do you start designing a large plane in 1914? There was very few literature about planes and in Germany the topic was so new that there wasn't even a word for plane yet. Since the plane would fly over water for most of the flight, Donier decided to design a seaplane. Donier didn't like the empirical design approach of Zeppelins, in other words, trial and error. He was a new generation of analytical engineers and wanted to design his plane by calculations and simulations. So he started a project at the Technical University in Berlin Charlottenburg to find the best shape of the hull for minimum drag in the water. They had a laboratory with a water channel to analyze different shapes. From British and American patterns and small planes in the German aircraft magazine Flugsport, Dornier could work out some vague key values. The overall weight of the plane is around three times bigger than the payload. And you need one horsepower for 15 kilograms of the plane's weight. Including the unknown weight of crew, fuel and structure, Dornier assumed a weight of 9 to 10 tons for the plane. Remember that planes at this time usually had a weight of less than one tenth of that. Based on his rough research, he would need at least 600 horsepower for the 9000 kilogram takeoff weight. So he chose three Maybach airship engines with 210 horsepower each. Also, planes at this time were built with wood, and they only used metal for reinforcement cables. Donier was a young, successful engineer and not scared to make the brave decision to use metal for his plane. Based on the mass, he could calculate the structure of the plane and design a beam for the main wings. Then he went to the famous Professor Prantl in his Aerodynamics Institute in Göttingen and started a project there to analyze a number of different wing profiles for a given thickness the beam thickness he worked out before. During the design process of the plane, Götting could optimize the wing profile more and more, which gave less drag and more lift. In the end, the massive plane had 329 square meter wing area, 43.5 meter span, 630 horsepower, was designed for 100 km per hour cruising speed, had 9 tons takeoff weight and, as requested, 1000 kg payload. This whole project happened within the Zeppelin company, because Donier was still employed at Zeppelin and had his own research department. When Donier decided to build a seaplane, it was clear that they needed a workshop close to the water. And what a coincidence that the Zeppelin company is located at Lake Constance. So they acquired a property in Seesmos at the lake and built a hangar with 50 meter span to accommodate the large plane. They chose wood for the hangar to save money and time. At the same time, it was decided that it would be best if the design department is right next to the workshop, rather than a few kilometers away. And so they built a temporary wooden office right next to the hangar. It was only a temporary solution, but guess what? You can still see the wooden design office at its new location, next to the Donier Museum at Lake Constance. The Zeppelin company gave Donier some good engineers and sent him a few applications they didn't accept yet. He chose a couple of young engineers from these applications. Among them were Hans Klemm, who later became famous for his small sport planes and always described Donier as his mentor, and Adolf Rohrbach, who later designed the large Zeppelin Starken planes. All this investment and effort was always supported by Graf Zeppelin himself. He gave Donier's department everything they needed, and he was patient and believed in them. So, Donier's department built the large plane, which they called RS-1. They pushed it out of the hangar on 12th of October 1915 for the first time, so 16 months after the project started. First, they did tests in the water and the first flight should have happened at the end of the year. 
Just before Christmas, on 21st of December 1915, a storm destroyed the large plane in front of the hangar. So RS-1 never flew. And maybe that was good, because the plane was very heavy. They didn't keep track of the weight while designing it, so they never exactly knew the mass. Anyway, there was a high chance that RS-1 would never take off. So maybe, for Donier's career, it was good that the first plane was destroyed by the storm. Graf Zeppelin came to see the damage and just said, continue Donier, continue. Donier's plane department learned a lot from the first plane. In the background, they were already developing the next plane, RS-2. That was only possible because Donier was the only one in charge. So there were no discussions about starting a new project while the first one isn't finished yet. And he could decide what to do and how to do it. For example, they established a new way of creating complicated parts. Usually, you would design a part and make a technical drawing. You would give it to the workshop and let them produce it. You would then find that something doesn't work and make changes. And you would need a couple of versions until it works, which is a slow process. Donier's engineers roughly sketched a new complex part and gave it to the workshop. The workshop staff understood what this part should do and built it and tested it. When the part was ready, they gave it back to the design office, who then created a technical drawing of it. So they kind of reversed the standard design process. That way, they could get reliably working complex parts in pretty short time. And so, they could push the next plane, RS-2, out of the hangar, just half a year later on 30th of June 1916. Now, for RS-2, they continuously monitored the weight of the plane and they ended up at 6,500 kg takeoff weight and a massive 3,000 kg payload. But first, this thing had to fly. And that wasn't easy. The tricky part was getting it out of the water. They did lots of tests and the plane could never overcome the water resistance. Locals already created this rhyme, which means the boat from Seismos can't get out of the water. In the laboratory in Berlin, they found that adding a step in the hull to separate water flow drastically reduces drag. And they found out that you need to have the step pretty much below the center of gravity. But the plane still had too much resistance. They made the step deeper, longer, they even added air ducts to better separate the flow. Finally, Donier added another step at the end of the hull to separate flow there, and that was the last piece of the puzzle. They went out with RS2 again, with Donier lying in the hull on the ground to watch the behavior of the metal sheets around the step. Suddenly, the loud bangs from the waves got less and it was quiet. They were flying. What a relief that was for Donier. The massive plane, his first own plane, was flying. After the flight, he immediately went across the lake to the hotel where Graf Zeppelin was living. He had already seen the large plane flying and was delighted about Donier's progress. And by the way, one of the test pilots was the later famous Helmut Hirt. RS2 was a big step for Donier's young plane department. But it was a bit weak. The engines were always pretty stressed and Maybach had a new engine generation with 240 horsepower available. With Graf Zeppelin's approval, Donier was allowed to upgrade the RS2 from three 210 horsepower Maybach engines to four 240 horsepower Maybach engines. They now positioned two engines behind each other something that will become characteristic for Donier planes. So they can have four engines, but only the frontal area of two. This new RS-2B version was flying on 6th of December 1916 for the first time. The improvement was impressive. Cruising speed increased from 103 to 128 km per hour, and service ceiling was 3000 meters. Because of the weight increase, the payload stayed the same. So to summarize that, at the beginning of the war, in 1914, Graf Zeppelin realizes that planes are the future. He instructs Donier to build such a large plane, which is more than 10 times heavier than normal planes at that time. Donier, who didn't have experience with planes, decided not just to design a seaplane, but also to build it with metal. And after two and a half years, they had such a plane, which could actually fly, worked reliably, showed good performance, and even had a payload of now three tons. Donier's department learned a lot again and wanted to build the next version, RS-3. Graf Zeppelin approved this again, but unfortunately he couldn't see it flying anymore in December 1917. 
Graf Zeppelin passed away on 8th of March 1917. Now, Donier's big mentor and supporter was gone. But Donier's mission was accomplished. His department was no longer an aircraft research department. They now became a proper aircraft manufacturer. They did lots of tests with RS3, which could increase speed to 136 km per hour and had an almost 1000 kg higher payload than RS2. It was the first plane they handed over to the German Navy on 19th of February 1918. With this, the Zeppelin company decided to turn the Department Do into an own company. Because until now, Department Do was officially a Zeppelin research department. They founded the Zeppelin Werke GmbH Lindau and made Don Jewe CEO. The design office moved to the city of Lindau at Lake Constance. And they designed the next generation, RS4. They could improve the design even further and now used the additional wing floats at the sides for the first time. Another detail that will become characteristic for Donier planes and which gives planes a lot of stability in the water. But not just that. There was such a high demand for small spotter planes and fighters that Donier's company was very busy. One of their selling points was that the planes were built with metal and without external reinforcement. So they were very stable, reliable and had a drag advantage. So now Donier has his own plane company. The war is over, Germany lost and the French army comes to Donier to learn everything about his giant planes. They decide that the finished RS4 which Donier wanted to hand over to the German navy had to be destroyed. In the next episode we will find out how Donier managed to keep his company alive and how he could re-establish as an aircraft manufacturer, although that wasn't allowed in Germany with the Versailles Treaty. If you want to support this channel, please consider to become a B-Sport Club member for more videos like this and see you at the next one.